Hello everyone. Welcome to the stopover study visit number five. Stopover is a series of study visits which will continue until November this year. It convinces individuals and groups from physically distant places to learn about their daily experiences and practices in relation to the current situations shaped by a specific context. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to Japan Foundation Manila, together we design and textile art museum.ph for their kind support to realize this project. Before we start, we would like to remind everyone that today's session is recorded and will be uploaded on Lord Nadito's website and social media. We hope to facilitate casual interactions with all of you. So please use the chat box or raise hand to join the conversation in time. We aim to make this gathering a safe space for everyone. Thank you for your presence, participation, and sharing of your warm energies with us. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. So today's session has two parts. It will start by inviting the three speakers, Kong Cabrera, Mizuho Ishii, and Jessica Kasawai, to give us short 10 minute presentations about their practices. In the second part, we pass the screen to Jessica to moderate the conversations with Kong, Mizuho, and the audience. Okay, so first I would like to invite Kong. Kong Cabrera is a visual artist and independent curator who started joining exhibitions in 2006 and has attended a number of curatorial workshops that mostly bring together young practitioners from Asia. In recent years, she has self-organized and facilitated micro discussions on artistic and curatorial anxieties. She currently works at the University of the Philippines Diliman as a contractual instructor while finishing her master's thesis and freelancing as a writer and designer. Okay, Kon, um, screen is yours. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Can you hear and can you see the screen? Yes. Thank you, Mayumi. Yes. I prepared the speech with us 10 minutes. So, hi, everyone. I'm Con Cabrera. I'm a visual artist and independent curator. Um, as an artist curator, I've always been thinking about how my roles interact, overlap, or influence my creative process. I've also been fascinated by the work and practices of many artist curators in our community. I pay attention to curatorial projects that have clear and sharp artistic gestures, such as how Chitz Ramirez transforms exhibition spaces, like what he did for the gas piece and the Lena's retrospectives, or how Parasite Projects and Nomi Nanuda thoughtfully displayed our artworks for field notes. I'm also very much interested in artworks and exhibitions that employ curatorial tools and strategies, like Jose Tense Ruiz Pabitin, Ingo Bunoan's Archiving Chabet, or Poklong Anadin's Shared Residence. So the image here is a banner work, which I tried to measure in our small room that is also our bedroom, dining area, play space, and sometimes office. Um, so the persona of the artist curator has been a subject of my research too which I am able to interrogate further in writing or in presentations. This slide was included in a teaching demo lecture I did in UP a few years back. The list is loosely based texts by Karen Flores and Yason Banal in Pananaw 6, Lisa Chikiamko's S titled Curatorial Identity, and from my own experiences and conversations. As I was preparing for today's panel, I can't help but evaluate my personal journey and figure out how I got here. The following slides will show you significant moments in my practice that shape the way I work, think, and connect. This is my way of accounting for the work that is often invisible yet very much performed.
Oh, in 2005, I became member of Southern Tagalog Exposure, a multimedia collective based in Laguna. STX produced the video works A Day in the Life of Gloria Arroyo, uh, Dong Abay's World War III music video, these were shown in Animahena Shon. Tuparin natin ang banta ng ating panahon that won second place in CCP Gawad Alternatibong Pelikula. The film is Red Saga and Alingangaw na mga pumulo to name a few. One of my tasks was to make graphics for our magazine and various video productions. In STX, we also made documentaries that were the lives of the marginalized in Southern Tagalog. This was during Gloria Arroyo's regime, a time when there were a lot of human rights violations and extrajudicial cases in the region. Very much like this. We were also engaged in organizing cultural events, both in the Metro and in Laguna, which of course included film festivals. STX was what was at the forefront of the Artist Alliance, Arrest Gloria, at the height of the Hello Garcia scandal that exposed the then president of manipulating the vote count in the election of 2004. Here are some posters um, from STX designed by different men. So in 2007, Arrest Gloria became Artist's Arrest or artists' response to the call for social change and transformation. This artist alliance had a broad membership from the fields of visual arts, music, film, literature, theater, and cultural works. In arrest, we engaged members and audiences in events that tackled, popularized, or supported advocacy work on human rights. We were active in campaigns for the freedom of political prisoners and have worked with different institutions and organizations who are on the ground attending to the oppressed or have the same advocacies. So here you can see um, a poster uh, for an album launch by Axel Pinpin and Bobby Balingit. And then on the right is, a, is the web page for Fact Sheet, which is an exhibition on um, human rights also. We were also active collaborators and participants in efforts by other artist initiatives and campaigns such as the Neo Angono censorship case in 2007, Tutok Karapatan's art events and first protest mobilizations and caravans with the broader sectors like the annual SONA and historical commemorations of peasant and workers. So photos here you can see this is me, Bunch and Dex. Bunch Garcia and Dex Fernandez um, making the mural in Sambalikhaan and then some protest actions. On top is the National Press Club protest for the Neo Angono censorship case. Um, on the lower right, I borrowed a uh, performance art by Boyd Kalubayan in 2007 titled Morning, which I did in Sona. Mm. In 2012, I joined a number of curatorial workshops to help me find my voice and execute ideas. So I sort of became an independent curator by this time. Uh, the workshops I was able to attend provided me the opportunity to imagine different ways of working and the space to present my preoccupations. I have worked with different artists to private and public entities. So these are just some of the exhibitions that I was able to work on. So on top is the white noise exhibition, which was part of the forces at work in Vargas. The left is the work by Cologne for Manila Biennale. The right image is from, to give a moment a, a name, uh, the drawing room. So um, through this work as independent practitioners, independent practitioner, I was able to sharpen my management skills, but was also faced with different types of challenges, this time more immersed and emanating from the art world. I was compelled to handle administrative and logistical tasks, which I learned how to do as I went along and through the people I've worked with. I was also given opportunities to curate in Japan through the Rikuzen Artist in Residence program. Through the years, my independent practice 
I was not really independent in the sense that I was always working with collaborators. Some of the work that I have done as curator and as project coordinator were born out of social capital. Some I actively saw. So images here, you can see Resetting the Clock at the CCP 2018. And the right images are from an archive room I installed in Japan in 2019. In 2015, I entered graduate school at the Department of Art Studies in UP. In my classes, I was able to make sense of what I was doing and those around me using different theoretical lenses. I was exposed to the wealth of writing and thinking about art by local writers and scholars. So the image is an essay I wrote for Traffic Volume 1, published in 2018, which I initially submitted for a class uh, about engagement of publics. I also took electives on audiovisual archives and archives conservation. My curatorial courses involved me in cultural mapping, heritage work, and inventory projects. I got to work with my classmates and professors even outside the classroom and in different capacities. So I just included here some photos of me with my classmates in um, archives class where we learned how to manually edit film reels at the FBCP, community archiving workshop, cultural mapping training in Aurora, and one work afternoon with my fellow research assistants for the university collections mapping project. Being a scholar of course, also influenced my work as an artist curator. Some specific manifestations are shown here. Number one, a zine I made for the exhibition Periphery. I included here all my essays in um, graduate school. I also did a situated reading as an extension of my artworks for field notes. Uh, my project proposal for a sand art intensive workshop that I attended in Saigon in 2018 was about archiving and unarchiving the Occupy Bulacan movement. So through this sort of recollection of 15 or 16 years of practice, I realized that um, my method is a form of movement that involves other people extending art making or exhibition making to dialogues in us educational experiences. It is emotionally invested and requires a form of consent, or at the very least, balance openness. It is everything else that is happening outside or at the outskirts of art making, and in some instances is invisible and unaccounted for. Since this is a studio visit, would like to say that my studio space is not permanent because I, I live a precarious work life. It is shared with my family, friends, colleagues, collaborators, and it shifts depending on the demand of my tasks. I have worked everywhere and anywhere, making the physicality of sight a little abstract. And because activism, cultural work, art production, and the academe shaped me, my space always strives, strives to be empathetic, Attentive, critical, and responsive. The art world has its own channels of validation for artists that I would argue are common motivating forces. As a watching commercial success, critical reviews, write-ups, publications. But how about those who actively engage in art management, coordination, curatorship, who also contribute to the art world to make, to make it functional and robust? These fields have different, though intersecting sets of politics and systems, are also as significant as art making. I suggest that we imagine our own barometer to measure outcomes that will validate our work, including those that are unaccounted for. So I hope um, that we can carve a safe space to talk about this more today and collectively think about how we can start acknowledging and appreciating uh, invisible labor to have sustainable and healthy lives in art. Thank you. Thank you, Kong. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And next, I would like to invite Mizuho. Okay, so Mizuho graduated from Graduate School of Fine Arts at the Tokyo University of the Arts, specializing in design. 
design art. After pursuing her own artistic practice and running an independent artist in residency program, she assumed the ARCAS project coordinator post in 2012 until 2021, where she coordinated various artistic and archival projects. Currently, she's working as an assistant art producer in an art management company. Okay, so Mizuho's screen is yours. Yes, I shared the data. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, nice to meet you everyone. My name is Mizuho Ishii. I'm speaking from Ibaraki, Japan. Uh, thank you very much for this great opportunity and I'd like to express my gratitude to uh, Lord Nadito team. This stopover opportunity really made me think uh, about the stopover my personal time. Please let me introduce myself first. I studied in design course in Tokyo University of the Arts. I was studying mixed media painting mainly with following the professor's way. When I was a student in the middle of the 90s, uh, artists started to express their work at, out of museums and the galleries. I mean, the beginning of a movement which artists go out to public place or community. So I wanted to be an artist too. In the early 90s, uh, artists in residency programs were hardly known in Japan. And to this extent, ARCAS project is a pioneer among the Japanese residency programs. It wasn't as popular as foreign artists coming to town and doing art projects in the suburbs. It was quite new for me at the time. And when I was coordinating of archive project, I found the article that the governor and the president of the Tokyo University of the Arts had an interview on the newspaper. It shows beginning of history that the president requested the governor to build the artist village in Ibaraki. But artist village is not new so much. Uh, what governor accepted was to bring uh, air project, artist in residency project to Japan. Then air project, which is called Arcas project was uh, established in Japan. Then I knew that my town invite invite international artists from overseas in 1994 as the first trial pilot project. Also Japanese artists. Uh, and also Japanese artists selected as artists in residency in 1996. And its purpose is to promote regional development through the art. As a government led led cultural program. This is the longest running program in Japan, at least for now. Therefore, I was more interested in the activities of foreign artists who, comes, who came to my hometown than attending the university in my neighborhood. I worked as an artist and at the same time volunteered as a citizen for 15 years. And then I practiced the residence project myself as an artist after that, I worked as a contract employee uh, and then in town also two years with public sector for 10 years. In this June, and I retired this institution. It's hard for me to talk about each project for 10 years within 10 minutes. So I briefly introduce some topics and share with you guys. And I share some of my experience to manage art projects and caring not only other people, but also yourself, which is what I got to understand uh, little by little. As I, as I said, I starting volunteer was, uh, night, starting volunteer was 1997. It was, uh, I was a at, at student. It was lucky because artists living in my town. Firstly, to be friend, to, with artists going to drink, chatting, sharing with them, and I was learning English, following artists uh, to shopping, finding materials, take them to the register and then translating. It was so simple. And also I got a grant and the research Southeast Asian Art Collective. Now people saying at the time we called alternative space. So I, after I came back from Southeast Asia countries, I started running residency with artists in 2007. It was renovating for 400 years old warehouse, uh, which all the village mayor was living. 
creating artworks, also learning residency with artists. I learned communicating with local community and all the people and then to let them know our activities. Applying grant, grant, collecting money for learning, inviting artists, also doing performance event with local young kids. The first proper residency which we learned, we invited artists from United States and the Cuban nationality artists. We worked together under the same roof I knew that learning residency with artists was not so easy to. After that, I started working in official public uh, organization, which was ARCAS. There, there are two programs mainly. While learning the residency programs, they also focus on local program whose, whose aim is to bring art closer to locals. Here, I would like to give you some examples from local program. And this local program invited the Japanese artists and asked them to organize workshop and lectures. Constellations of the Earth, it's Kuba Constellation and Moria Constellation. This is a collaboration with scientists and artists who are unit. I coordinated to planning of lecture and workshop for local participants. We used the Earth observation satellite, AROS2, to draw a constellation on the ground. AROS is Advanced Land Observation Satellite. This satellite always looking at our mother Earth. This project is created by the unit of artists and scientists. They are an oil painting professor and a scientist who utilize artificial satellites at JAXA. JAXA is an organization uh, like NASA in Japan. Theoretically, this project is open to anyone, anywhere, if there is opportunity for satellites to come then, and if you are on the earth, this is the internet live. Simply put by intentionally installing the radio wave reflector on the ground, as observation satellites are observing the ground in the sky by analyzing the difference in the reflected data, constellations appear on the ground like a geograph of the night sky. This is an art project that can be done only when the Earth is peaceful, because artificial satellites can be used only when there are no natural disasters. When there are no natural disasters, such as earthquakes or uh, volcano eruption on the Earth. The other project I conducted was uh, air bridge. Not see all the visual image. The other project I conducted was Air Bridge in 2019 to 2020. It was connect the effort, effort of experimentally conducting artists in residence at a psychiatric hospital. I bridged an air format to the psychiatric hospital where artists from overseas were invited to a hospital. What I learned here is how therapists working in the hospital can engage in art activities with patients and connect them to treatment and whether the existence of an artist works. How would the environment change if there were actually artists there? What do artists produce? And what does the coordinator need as a function? This was uh, the first project to bring the artist who has experience of residence in the psychiatric hospital from over, overseas to stay in the hospital. I wasn't directly involved in the, uh, in the operation, but I was able to hear stories from artists there. The following year, I conducted a trial to dispatch the coordinators to hospital. It was the last year. The reason is that in the hospital, there are therapists who look at the patient, but there are no professionals to manage the artists. At the end of one month coordinator spending activity, we held the online open talk session with psychiatric artist, curator, uh, therapist, and then dispatch coordinator. How, uh, I share how did the artist feel? What did the coordinator need? How did the therapist and also patient felt? I've shared it. So far, I would like to recall. No, 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 no.
It's okay. So, so far, I would like to recall the other events I have experienced in 10 years. I hope it will be a, some topic of the, uh, this uh, stopover today. For example, on the day when a female artist arrived to Japan, she found out she was pregnant and immediately arranged for her to be taken to the hospital for medical check. During the residency, her baby also growing up. When the, another artist suffered from food, po food poisoning and become ill, I, look, I took him to the hospital even on Sunday night. It was when I was driving assistant. A junior high school student was suspicious of the artist shooting in the, my uh, passenger seat, and we were notified by the police. Then next day, the police came to my home and then questioned. In Japan, filming, filming girls and children without permission is considered a crime for harassment. Even if you claim that the artist was a man and was just shooting landscapes and residential areas. At the time, I had a call and then I was suspicious because I was driving white car with glasses and the mask. Now everyone in the world wearing the mask though. Another artist was researching in the riverside about 100 kilometers by bicycle from Moria to the Pacific Ocean. On the morning of their camping, we were warned that missile had been launched from North Korea. They called me, what should we do? I could only say, because it doesn't land, just wait there. We had no time to ask the solution to the uh, committee office, actually. Even when the evacuation warning sounds due to a typhoon, there is no choice but to instruct the artist to save and inform that they have food and wait it in the shelter for some holidays and night. And if it's connecting, it's okay. So even if uh, I sent uh, the artist to the airport, if the flight was canceled due to sudden snow, I would hurry to call the airline on the last day of their stay to secure a ticket and uh, book a hotel. It is normal. So from entering this country to leaving, uh, it can be said that the residency, was, uh, residency program was carried out by taking care of all their life other than the artist production activities. So why uh, that it that it I did while carrying the artists who are coming to Japan for the first time, I also take care of local people who are involved in the project and also take care of administ administrative office staff. Easily, in the environment where there are professionals working in art, I had I had to take care of myself while adjusting. So what kind of rule does art management work, work in this society? I quit my job that I had been learning for 10 years in June, and I remember it and realize it. I hope I can relax and talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mizuho. I am sure many of us who are here today uh, associating a lot of experience with you. And I'm feeling a bit emotional because it's bringing your talk brought me back lots of memories from the past experience, but that we can discuss later on with Cheska. So um, thank you very much, Mizuho. Um, now I would like to invite Cheska. So Cheska is a freelance culture worker with an interdisciplinary research and arts practice. Year round, she wears many hats, taking on creative curatorial producer and management roles, as well as research and writing duties. She provides support for independent artists and initiatives and has done consultancy work for different institutions. She works mostly with new media, performance, translation, and hybrid form formats, and in various capacities, has been invited and selected to participate in programs and projects in the Philippines and internationally. Jessica, and screen is yours. Hello, hi everyone. Thank you, Mayumi, for the introduction and thank you, Lord Nadito, for inviting me. Um, I think this is also a good opportunity to introduce myself properly <laughs> to, to my peers because I think a lot of 
our friends who are I can see here, hello friends, um, just know me as in a particular way, um, maybe just as a, a happy drunk in in art openings. But yeah, so this is a good opportunity for me to also like talk about um my background and the art practice that I do. So I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, no, I will stop sharing my video so that to save so I can save bandwidth and then start sharing. Is it okay? Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. All right, so the way I kind of organized uh, my short presentation is I will first show a slideshow um, that kind of discusses my background and the art practice that I do. So I kind of framed it as form versus content. And then for the last part, I, I try to share with, with you um, my current direction or current concerns of where I am now in my practice. Hello, my name is Francesca Kasaway. Uh, I'm from Quezon City, Metro Manila, Philippines. Um, I was born in 1984 and I continue to live and work here uh, in Metro Manila. Um, I guess I self-define under the broad term cultural worker because aside from cultivating my own artistic practice, I also do a lot of the invisible things that ensure there is a space uh, for culture to thrive. Um, so I did not attend art school. I'm a sociology major from the University of the Philippines, which is the national university here. I've been meaning to attend graduate school full time, but all these art projects started happening and I decided to focus on, on the practice for now. I did take up electives in graduate classes in humanities, poetry, cultural studies and film production. So I can say I have a grasp on how to read um, different art forms. I was also previously for a brief period, uh, an advertising copywriter and a copy editor for a publishing house. So uh, I've worked with language um, and continue to do so. Uh, most of the artistic tools that I have now, I learned by doing and on the fly. So I taught myself basic coding, music production, and video editing technology technologies, which are all pretty like basic, but I guess just enough to suit my needs. Um, so for my own creative practice, I employ multidisciplinary approaches and use mostly audiovisual or multimedia techniques to, to make work. Um, but before that, I want to talk about um, like the other cultural work that I do, which is uh, producing and managing local and international art projects and providing curatorial and artistic support for the independent art sector. So I sort of serve as an interface between the artists, institutions, and other stakeholders, um, simultaneously translating institutional language to the artist's language and vice versa. And oftentimes literally translating between English and the Filipino language and all the different kinds of Englishes. Um, so some photos that I wanna show from 2000 to 2007 to 2012, I was a producer and organizer for independent music gigs. Um, so I started cultural work uh, mainly by being an organizer of um, this, music concerts. From 2009 to 2018, I was festival manager and later on co-director for a new media arts festival called Wasak, Festival of the Recently Possible. Um, Wasak means in Filipino to destroy, um, where, which I guess sort of uh, explains what we were trying to do that time, which was destroy preconceived notions on how art and technology can work together. Um, 
Okay, so that's for the form. Uh, for the content, I guess in my artistic practice, I, I usually begin with a theme or question to investigate. And from there, I try out different tools that best express this exploration. So I find myself usually working with and across a range of media. Most of the times, these find expression through text, sound, video, performance, um, and curating a program or live event. So from something visual or static, to something oral and temporal, to something that combines visual and audio elements, um, to something that involves movement plus all of those, and to something that becomes four-dimensional, culminating into a live event. I'm mostly interested in the links between place and displacement and cultural identity, history and memory, um, creative uses of technology, and how this links with uh, feminism um, and dramaturgy and interdisciplinary translations as well. Okay, so let me stop there. Um, and now we go to um, this slide, which is what I tried to do here is I tried to, to compile. This is just some of the organizations that I've worked with over my more than 10 years of practice as well. So like Mizu, I've been um, working in the creative industry, the arts and culture for more than 10 years. Um, and as you can see here, I've done the rounds with all the major uh, universities. I've done work with UP, Benilde, um, Arete, Ateneos Arete. Um, some work for Thames International, uh, and this uh, whole list of um, international funding organizations. And then um, these are just some of the, the international festivals that I've uh, worked with or had previous engagements with. Um, so when, when I was compiling this, I actually had a headache trying to recall you know all the good and bad experiences that that i've had but another feeling as i was you know pasting all these these images was a feeling of pride i'm pretty proud of myself for having survived those years of you know um working with institutions which um a lot of you may agree is quite difficult, especially when you're coming from an independent arts practice. Um, so uh, I, I guess it also goes without saying that I've been a witness to a lot of working styles across these different organizations, different practices, different policies. Um, and with every roadblock we, roadblock we encounter um, with these different orgs, there are also different safeguards and strategies in place um, to try to solve them. So for this next slide, I have tried to compile um, the independent uh, artists or curators initiatives um, that I've worked with in the past. So rather than enumerating specific projects that I've done, I chose to mention these, um, these things instead um, that I've either worked with or provided support with over the years. As also a shout out because um, you know, I, I think since this is recorded, I just want to reiterate that my heart and my loyalties will always stay with, with the independent art sector, you know, no matter how, how many consultancies I do with the institutions, like my advocacy will always um, prioritize the independent uh, practitioners and the collectives. Um, so it's quite interesting for me to also review and reflect um, and realize that I have amassed all these experiences, you know, working with such diverse actors and trying to translate between those different institutions and these different um, artists and collectives, which as you can see also do uh, cover a wide range of, of art practices. So some are musicians, some are um, visual artists, some are more multidisciplinary artists and I guess working with local artists and international artists, there's a different 
kind of learning that happens there, you know, trying to, to bridge the cultural divide and the things that get lost in translation um, when we work with, with international um, practitioners. Okay, so that said, um, I want to share where I am currently um, with my practice. This is the current direction that I find myself in. So first is, um, right now I find myself um, more interested in the why, the who, and the how um, of a project more than actually what we are making and how much I am going to make. Um, and this is a big jump from my younger days where before I guess I would get super excited because the project seems cool and you know it's the next innovative thing. But um, I guess at this point I'm not really concerned about that. I'm more concerned about why, like the intention behind the particular project, who I will be working with, and if I know enough about the, the partners involved and if my values align with them and the how, like what are the actual working conditions that I'm getting myself into? Because these are things that we don't usually ask when we're excited about the, the prospect of a new exciting artwork. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm past that at this point. <laughs> I mean, sure, I get excited still about, about um, new methods of, of artwork, of making art, but when I myself, um, get invited, uh, I try to ask more of these three questions, why, who, and how, before I say yes. So I guess um, at this point, I'm also more intentional about the projects that I accept. Okay, and secondly, um, this is a big question, I guess that also Mizu and, and Kon also asks. So if you're the art manager, who manages you? who manages your own life. Because when you're managing other people's lives, other people's careers, sometimes you forget to, to do the same to yourself, right? And who takes care of the carer? As an arts manager, you are usually the one who manages schedules, budgets, you know, administrative stuff, even creative stuff, you know, taking on creative stuff. But um, when the artists go on vacation, you don't usually go on vacation. So um, I guess that said, the point I'm trying to make is um, me, I am, I believe in a very collaborative process. Um, personally, I don't do solo work. And even with the solo practitioners that I choose to work with, we, I try to establish from the outset, you know, trying to think about making the artwork together. So we make sure that we are both involved in every step of the process. Because, you know, um, the solo artist's choices has an implication with the administrative process. And if we don't communicate, you know, something falls through the cracks along the way. At the same time, if I don't communicate the administrative limitations to the artist, then he or she um, kind of gets the wrong... Um, directions to move forward so even with solo practitioners i try to make it very collaborative um, if i'm gonna be somebody's collaborator or arts manager um, and yeah i also <laughs> try to to maybe open the discussion to the reality that okay i will provide care but whoever I'm working with has to do the same. It has to be a reciprocal process. You know, if it means following the deadlines I set, because that will make our work easier, then I kind of expect for the, the artist or the collective to, to kind of follow the, the, pre, the previous agreements that we set, right? Um, or if it's not possible to always keep lines of communication open, if we need to adjust anything, because I, I guess we all know, you know, a lot of unexpected things happen in an art project and you can't always control all these factors. But to, to you know, establish from the outset that we are free to communicate, that it is a safe space to call out um, if we are behind or if there's anything wrong with, with the process that's ongoing, then for me, that's already the first step. To solving problems um yeah i guess i'm more of a troubleshooter i try not to focus on the drama when something 
you know, gets delayed, I immediately go to problem solving mode. And, you know, we can deal with the drama later on. Also, you know, art managers also have personal lives. And this is, I guess, something we, we forget as well. You know, um, when a project is ongoing, the expectation is the, the arts manager or the coordinator will be on call 24-7. And that is very wrong and a practice that we should we should, I think, try to, to revisit or think about. Um, hi, artists that are here. I hope you're listening to me. Um, to, to, all, to also, you know, acknowledge the reality that your coordinator or arts manager also needs to rest and cannot be at your beck and call 24-7. <laughs> okay, so I guess the third, my third point is, with all that being said, um, I kind of realize now that what I'm advocating for with all these, you know, amassed knowledge that I've had from working with institutions and independent practitioners is trying to figure out how to trickle down all this institutional knowledge and best practices to independent practitioners so we can strategize accordingly. Sorry, that's a typo. Um, you know, um, help them how to strategize to write grants, make budgets, manage admin work. These are all very tedious and boring stuff, but as you know, any artist doing an, an art project will know, these are all very essential stuff. And admittedly, not a lot of our independent practitioners have you know, the first idea about how to even begin making a budget, for example, or how to write a proposal. So this is a service that I provide um, to, to the current um, artists that I'm working with now. And it's been, you know, a learning experience for, for both sides. And I find that, I guess, during this pandemic as well, since the, the conditions are changing, we need to be clearer about what we're promising and what is being promised to us. Especially, you know, this work from home setup, it blurs the lines between work and home life. And sometimes, you know, there's no home life for you to go back to anymore because you just spent 12 hours online trying to troubleshoot stuff. So um, I will stop there and maybe... I guess before we open the, the Q&A to our audience, I first want to do a temperature check to um, Mizu and, and Pon to ask how has it been for them, you know, with the pandemic and I guess Japan and the Philippines have uh, slightly different um, situations in terms of what we of lockdowns but yeah so my question for for Mizu and and Kon is we we do a lot of care work for the projects that we do but also as women we're socially stereotyped and expected to provide care work and domestic domestic work in our own homes so you know immediately that's a double load for for us and again, as I've mentioned, this has been blurred with work, with work from home set up and, you know, the whole, the whole virtual meetings thing. So maybe you could share a bit um, about your living situation. How has it been, you know, trying to manage this, this blur? Um, are you living with a partner, with children, with pets? And how has it been for you? Um, so Kon or Mizu, who wants to, to start first? Okay, I'll start first because Mizu is looking at the camera and like, okay. So um, this year we started renting out another space for, as a workspace, as a like studio space for me to concentrate on the work that I do. So I think because of the pandemic since last year, I had to change how I work. I can't no longer I can no longer work anywhere and everywhere. 
I, I should change and really not change because it's just going back to like working in my own space and time. So I have my husband who's a visual artist and an eight, uh, I have an eight-year-old son. Of course, there are compromises and no negotiations. But I think what's crucial for us is a clear communication like having to say to them that I have to work during this time. Don't bother me. I'll be in the other space. And they do that. And they take part in doing chores and other stuff for home. And also, uh, buying food is the best thing that happened in the pandemic. So grab food is the way that, or it saved for me having to not cook every day. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Con. I, I guess I can also actually relate. I've considered, you know, saving up for a dishwasher, an automatic dishwasher, just to to kind of take the load of all the house chores. <laughs> um, because, yeah, it's, it's for me personally, it's been very, very difficult to to divide, you know, to take time for housework and laundry and all this stuff on top of the other work that we have to do. Um, yeah. So, Mizo, would you like to share um, anything about your own experience? Yeah. So, when the last project I conducted at the time, really, really uh, difficult for me to uh, the working with the, the therapist, who are working in a psych, uh, psychiatric hospital because they also have to take care of the patient and, and also have to be careful uh, to avoid the COVID-19. So uh, in my job uh, was getting slower and also I am living with my parents and then I'm single. So I, I was more care about my parents because they are like 70 year, over the 70 years old. So no one knows how they can pick up the, the virus. So, and then for me, my, my health also not so good at the time. So I start planting, start planting. And then also I care about the, my pet cat. But uh, this August, my 16 years old, very cute cat passed away. And then, yeah, quite um, slow down. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like a businessman in Japan, they had to work at the, and then the restaurant and the many shops have to keep on open the shop and then they have to do the business. Compared with that, I'm working under the, uh, uh, government uh, like, uh, um, public sector so I was not so strict uh, living good life just caring about to take care of like um, it, uh, from avoid from the COVID-19 yeah just slow, slow down yeah is that okay Yes, yes. Um, do you have any kind of strategies or techniques you use to, to take care of yourself? Like what are the things that you enjoy to relax or I guess to, to feel better? Since the COVID-19 has started, I don't need to go for work. Actually, the studios. So I could relax actually. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's great. So this work from home thing is a double-edged sword. So on one hand also, I guess in the Philippines, it's such a relief to not be able, not have to commute because the traffic is so bad here and mm. we don't have to waste the whole day being stuck in traffic. So that's that's one. But yes, on the other hand, the, the downside there is since you are available online, your boss or your colleagues can all, always bug you when they have questions about uh, a project. Okay, so um, now we are going to open the floor to any questions from the audience. 
would you like to ask Mizu Kon or me or Mayumi? Please feel free to to join the conversation if if you also want to to share anything. Um, and audience for our guests, please feel free to just raise your hand or just type something in the chat if you have a question for any of our speakers. Okay, I think you're shy. How about it for you, Jessica? During this COVID remote work, how have you been dealing with it? Um, so currently I live with, same with Mizu, I live with two senior parents. So I got stuck here in her family house. I had these big plans of moving to a big apartment, etc. before COVID hit. So I guess the money that I was going to make with all the projects that were lined up, they didn't push through. So I, I'm kind of stuck here for now. Um, it's been difficult because, <laughs> yeah, like what, what Korn and Mizu have already said, there's, you know, arts managing, managing art projects, and then managing your own life. So what I try to do is I make production schedules for my own life. Like I figured, why not apply all these technical skills that I do for the project? So I'll make a timeline for myself as well. But of course, since nobody is actually managing me, I get delayed. <laughs> So I need a second, I need a second Cheska. I need the Cheska to kind of help me manage my own life. But yeah, yeah, it's been difficult, but I'm, you know, there's an adjustment period. I think I'm I'm there already. I'm starting to to adjust and have a better handle of how to, to manage both the domestic chores and the, the actual work that pays the bills. Um, yeah, but maybe what I'll add there is it helps to have somebody share the burden, right? So, I mean, it gets more difficult if it's only you doing everything. Uh, they say like uh, a successful woman needs two things, a successful, I uh, know, a helpful partner and an understanding boss. So, you know, we need, I guess, yeah, I'm kind of, I kind of want to push back on the stereotype that only women do the housework. So I, I really demand my brother to, to kind of help. And my dad has been great. He's cooking. So we kind of share the housework. This is a good way to, you know, to support each other as well in the household. Um, and what about you, Mayumi? <laughs> we are managing somehow. I mean, it's up and down. So there are days, you know, we just don't feel good. And we, you know, there are many conflicts, small conflicts within the house. But I think what we learn, or what I learned at least, is to just go with the flow and maybe also accept myself. You know, because the same with um, you, Cheska, I really like to manage things also. But I just realized if I can't really manage myself, and especially with my emotions. So I just try to let it go. So I'm trying how not to manage and how not to be so dependent on this practice of management. Yeah. That's also a very good point. <laughs> because yeah, at the end of the day, we really can't control everything. Mm. We just have to kind of, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's very, because of what you said, I think, we ourselves are the most difficult thing to manage, no? <laughs> <laughs> That's the irony there. It's irony. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Wait, we have like a few questions from the chat. So we'll try to answer this for questions. And then I prepared a special activity for those who will still stay. Um, okay. So first question is from Jerome. Maybe this is for the arts managers. Wow, you're getting free consultations from three arts, four arts managers, actually. <laughs> so first question is, how do you handle when colleagues or collaborators don't deliver on what was previously agreed upon? Hala, okay. So I don't know, Mizu, what's the Japanese style of 
of oh. that problem <laughs> first. It's, it's a big tema. Uh, uh, yeah, I try to discuss with them somehow. Uh, yeah, how we make solution. But especially in a COVID-19, this pandemic timing or any time, I mean. I think it's more a general question. Oh, ah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Mizu says discuss and try to find the solution. Con, do you have but, any other strategies? Or, yes, Mizu, sorry, go on. Oh, ah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I tried, but yeah, sometimes it's really difficult, so. Yeah, go ahead, Kong, <laughs> please, next. <laughs> I think um, from past experiences, I, um, it's the change of tone is a big like thing. If you are friendlier on your correspondence and then if you're a bit irritated, your tone, it's more professional, less collegial, <laughs> or something like that. But because of... Also, I think it's um, transparency is a key uh, thing between like managers or curators and artists. If um, people are transparent or if artists are transparent about their situation or condition, it, it would be more manageable and it will not like escalate. But the thing with this is like if you have like trouble submitting on time, and then that means the people you work with will mark you, your name is Mark, and they will might not work with you again or something like that. So I, I, I guess, at, at least for me also, like personally, I always make sure that I leave a good impression on how I work and how I collaborate professionally or otherwise. So just to make those things more manageable and acceptable. Thank you, Con. Um, I think that's a very good tip. So the change in tone is also like a very big factor. It For me, it always is better to err on the safer side and start with a friendly tone. You know, you, you don't, there's an expression that says you don't attract bees with vinegar. So you know, being friendly and positive in, in your communications is a big key. Um, I guess, personally speaking for me as well, I find that some artists stop communicating because there's anxiety on their part. You know, it's, it's a, a chicken and egg problem. They didn't deliver uh, for a particular deadline, so they get anxious. And because they get anxious, they don't, they stop working and can't seem to move forward. And so, you know, the, you're, you get stuck in a project. And I find that one way to, to maybe try to get them unstuck is to, to make it clear to them that you're following up in a friendly way. You're not angry, you know, to make sure you're not angry and you, you, you're trying to follow up because you want to offer support. Yeah, so to, to frame it in that way and you're not following up because you want to scold them. Um, because sometimes this fear of being scolded is also stopping them from reaching out to you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's three practical tips that, that we can share. Um, okay, so Lena is asking, is it like starting from ground zero when this pandemic happened? Lena, is that directed to the three of them, to me? To... to all of you. <laughs> to all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe I'll answer first and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Kon and Mizu. For me, okay. yes. <laughs> because I had, again, I had a very clear plan of what my 2021 to 2023 was going to look like. And, you know, when the pandemic hit, none of those happened. So I had to, it was very a difficult time for me as well. I got anxiety, I got depression, I got, yeah, I couldn't work for, for like the first six months after the pandemic because I wasn't in a, a good frame of mind. 
because of this disappointment from from having my plans you know crushed my dreams crushed but yeah as i also said it's a period of adjustment so currently i'm, I'm trying to get back on track and yeah as with any other project that gets redirected you just have to make the best out of a bad situation and you know either you scale it down or you reframe it so that it kind of fits your your current conditions so that's me um mizu do you yeah. want to share yeah like yeah i i just so the techist the chatting techist so it you mean i also send like you like i start uh, actually it's a long longest project that's why i was perhaps like continuing the same uh, doing the same things as like before but uh, uh because of pandemic and then situation are totally changed so i also changed uh, how to work or how to communicate with adults and then and then i need i realized i need to manage myself then yeah it's quite tough for me and then and then yeah, I, I I really don't know the other managers and then coordinators in Japan uh, was feeling the similar thing or because the especially artist in residency is like inviting artists uh, who from overseas, but uh, all the opportunity we stuck, we stopped everything. So we cannot invite, we cannot make the communication program with artists and the locals. So all the thing uh, for us, uh, always it's normal but was totally changed to new normal i think yeah and then and then six months before you no know, last year i gradually i decided i better to leave uh, the reason was not only for that but yeah sorry <laughs> so yes big changes um what about for you? I think for me last year was more of like a work still continued and then early this year um CCP sort of announced the like break of events so I have a show that's cancelled actually two exhibitions that are cancelled and then but uh, some like Freelance work still, uh, I do for, of course, for financial reasons, but also because I am teaching now. And then there, there was sort of a recalibration of my goals or the things that I want to do. So it's sort of like, I always say that writing a thesis is like self-care because it's sort of, a, it's a very individualistic um, and it's, for my intellectual progress or development and it's not really it doesn't have a tangible purpose <laughs> maybe a diploma but it will feed us so it was for me a recalibration of the things that i want to do so slowly this year um i'm starting to let go of projects other projects and other um like side jobs that i have so that i can concentrate on um, research and writing, which is my gift to myself, <laughs> sort of. Yeah, I, I totally agree there that I think, if anything, this time has given us, you know, more perspective that we actually have to do things for ourselves too <laughs> and not just, you know, devote our work managing other people's lives okay so in the interest of time mayumi we only have 15 minutes correct yes but of course we can go over the time okay so yeah. i guess yeah just reading some of the questions here i think 
I will just quickly read it aloud for the others. Um, so one is how do you manage demands and delays? The other is looking forward and considering the new normal. How do you all see the exchange in cultural activities panning out? And then Aline, hi Aline, ask, I'm curious on the formalization of projects through contacts and agreements. Um, and Jerome is asking how to manage the self. Mark is asking if we believe the horoscope or zodiac, zodiac signs work with others. Uh, me, yes, personally. Me, and, yes, too. <laughs> and then following Zeus, friendships are closer relationships as foundations for interconnection. Is it ideal? How do you, and then Steve is asking, how do you work with artists, especially in this pandemic that is less personal interaction? How do you cope with the challenges this pandemic of this pandemic on Twitter? Okay, so, um, and then Mariano is saying that the idea of domestic and creative work aren't that far of each other. Sustenance in art making and art production, making art projects can be compared to preparing a meal. Yes, true. So I guess, yeah, from start to finish, it's a process that, that we are all involved in. Um, okay, so I think all of, those, all of those earlier questions can be digested more in this activity, in their, in this next interactive activity that um, I want to, to share with you. We are going to post a Jamboard link. Yes, this is inspired by Zeus from his past session. Um, yeah, so the link is there in the chat, but if you just want to look at the, the screen, that's also fine. You can type your, your comments and, and Jerome will help put it there. So here, I, I made a page called the draft contract. This is, I guess... For me personally, the practice of making agreements and contracts is an institutional knowledge that I want to nor I want to mainstream in our independent practice. Because as we all know, I guess at least for the Philippines, we we almost always exist through these informal agreements, right? Which is well and good, especially if you have good memories. But the reality is in the middle of a project and nobody wrote down what the agreements were, you get confused and it's not clear who's responsible and more importantly, who's accountable for certain deliverables and um, outputs, right? So for me, you know, working with institutions and them being so, so particular about drafting contracts first before any work starts that's already a good practice that we can assert you know it's i don't know it, it's not it seems ideal now because we all know sometimes you need to start work because of timeline constraints even if there's no contract yet but the best practice really is to have a draft signed before you start any work because that's protection for you um and just a contract for me is a way of thinking through what the intentions of a project are. If you took the time to write down or review, if you are the receiving um, party, these, these clauses, these demands, or these um, uh, terms of reference, it means you are serious and you are committed you know, to, to this project. Because uh, a lack of clarity is usually, for me, the reason why things don't work out because, you know, both all parties are not clear about who's doing what and when people are doing what. So, yeah, on that note, so this is a draft contract that I made. I want to see, also get an idea how the people in the audience feel or what they think should be written in the contracts that they're entering to in the next few projects. Um, so please feel free to, to use on the left side, there's um, a post it icon, you can type. There's also a text box icon, you can type. And there's also an image button. You can add images if you're a more visual person than a verbal person. 
then you can type there. So while people are typing, those who ask questions earlier, maybe you want to just air out some feelings, maybe while you're typing as well. Um, yeah, can I answer um, some of the go, questions? Go on. Yeah. Of course, um, for example, Zeus um, question about managing demands and delays. This is actually the first step is that you make a contract that is favor favorable to all parties or you make a schedule and then you have a backup plan. But... Uh, I guess the key thing, again, is transparency uh, on both parties for artists and curators or managers. Because otherwise, you have to manage those delays on your own and not with the person you're collaborating with, which is unfair to you. So I guess um, be transparent, provide the, like a MOA or a written Thing. If it's not a contract, a schedule that is distributed, that has like clear provisions of how and when are deadlines, etc. And then share the responsibility because you shared already the calendar. That means everyone is accountable, for example. Yeah, that I guess is a, like a way on how to manage those. Yeah, um, I think moving forward, I mean, I would maybe hosted by load na dito also. We could make a workshop, an informal workshop on how, I guess, for me personally, I do the contracts because I draft my own contracts. This is a safeguard that I do when people say, oh, sorry, we don't have a contract yet. I say immediately, well, I have a contract, so you, there's no excuse for you. So I, it comes from me. Um, and then they review, and then we go back and forth. So, Checks. Yeah. <laughs> parang in the Philippine context or inner circle, parang still a lot is averse to seeing contracts. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> really, it's because I think a lot of under the table things happen. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. so, again, that makes you think: Is this a project I want to be involved in? If it's under the table, I, sometimes you know. Or like the 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 <laughs> ano parang you say it's just a handshake agreement or gentleman's agreement. What the hell? Right, is. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I get that, and also we exist on on you know familiar collect uh, connections, friends. Some friends yeah. get in bed if you if you ask for a contract. But if you're real, really friends, then he should he should know he or she should acknowledge that you know Correct. this is best practice. Don't don't be so because sexy. it's actually protection for both of you. Exactly, they must realize that. True, true, true. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, can I also I just add, like, for now, like, a thread of email, for example, mm -hmm. even if it's repetitive, no, the agree those handshakes that you're talking about, you put down in an email, and then if it's, like, sent or and responded to, that, I think, is a contract in spirit, which would be, like, useful for you when time comes, like, when there's, like, unfair or something, like, just so I guess keeping a paper trail well yeah. now it's an electronic trail true true must email no kasi uh, ba group chat because everything is um being done over group chats already and sometimes when you handle a lot of projects it's hard to keep track of all the group chats you have created for those projects and then true. when they ask you something that you have answered already it's hard to like backtrack through the messages so, diba, insist on emails para there's already yeah. a subject True. head. <laughs> True. And there's a thread, you know. You just reply and then everything is there. I think part of what makes my arts management work difficult, precisely, Lena, is sometimes I'm tasked to, to gather all this information across platforms. So, I have to review a thread in the email and get information from the chat and information from a photo and compile it to to draft an actual contract um so 
<laughs> that's added work for us actually. Um, I, I see here, hi Rika. Okay, she's saying it's a struggle when things are in the contract and people sign it, then afterwards they ask questions that are addressed in the contract or the meeting. Um, <laughs> or just don't sign it if you don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess there's... We should kind of design a way where from the off- offset, it's clear that a contract will be involved so that... It's not a surprise to them. I'm not sure. And then once we have the contract, there's a contract meeting and you take however long it is to go through each term and, you know, devote the whole day if needed to go through each clause so that they have no questions. The thing with, you know, these institutional contracts as well, it's too legalese. The legal jargon is too heavy. Um, but maybe next time, if that workshop that I'm suggesting is going to push through, I have kind of a draft that says it in plain language. You know, a contract is just actually an agreement. It doesn't need to have all this heavy legal jargon for it to be valid. But as long as it's signed um, and everybody's clear about stuff. Ang hirap, ang hirap siya. It's difficult. It's not easy. <laughs> Okay. It's fun uh, to. I'm fun naman ng Jamboard. Diba? diba? <laughs> yes, Ito yes. na yung bagong ano, art activity. So. I Pwede... think if we're going to conceptualize the show, parang ganito lang. <laughs> yeah, no. This, so now there are these like interactive tools so you can conduct your art meetings um, when you're brainstorming, I suppose. And then everything is recorded, right? Automatically. So when you make your contract, you just pull from here. Yeah. Okay. So we quite have a few um, post-it notes here in the, the Jamboard. So I'm going to start reading some of them. So the prompts that Mayumi and I put are no work-related messages after six. I put their protection from harassment, colleagues and supervisor, because this is a clause that is usually missing from all our work contracts. It doesn't provide a provision for what happens if you experience power tripping from a colleague or your boss. And I think we need to be explicit about this, especially for women. You know, there's a lot of sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, Emotional support sold separately. Okay, who pays for the snacks? Horoscope Zodiac Science Compatibility, yes. A shared Google Sheet calendar for updates. Yes, I think this is very important in the contract. You know, there's the appendix where you put all the project info or all the attachments there for everybody's reference. And timeline of payment is very, very crucial and important because sometimes they put the cost but they don't put the dates of payment. And if you're a struggling artist, it's hard to guess when your next paycheck is. Oh, eh, para ano, hindi kayong, lang, ano, you don't ako guess ako. when you'll be asking for the payment. Right, right. Yeah. And if they're late, you have, you know, enough excuse to to bug them about it. Yes, um, tama, tama. Yeah. Okay, so another one is, is being strict with schedules set on paper helpful? A span of dates would be ideal. Since part of taking care of ourselves includes not imposing that much pressure on both parties, considering the flexible timeline. We, um, I think, I guess I'm more in the camp that it really, it's more helpful to have that dates written down. You can just frame it as targets and then put a clause that it's to be confirmed or to be adjusted as needed. But to have target dates there also helps you manage your timeline. Eh? Because if just if it's just an open date, then no, but nothing gets done. The deadline is there. Let's not be afraid of deadlines, guys. Deadlines are there to kind of prompt and jumpstart you into, into acting, <laughs> into action, actually. <laughs> because you're working towards you know, a particular end. 
So if I'm a member of a bigger project, let me know about the progress for the rest of it. I don't want to be left in the dark. Okay, agree. Work breakdown, roles, of, roles and scope of commitment. This is, you know, crucial. This is a crucial part. It helps to be as specific as you can. You know, if it's generic, that's also fine uh, just to have a contract sign because sometimes it takes time to really break down the, the rules. But if you can, from the outset, it really helps to be as specific as you can when breaking down your, your responsibilities. Okay. Jessica, uh, yes. Jessica, excuse me. Uh, promote lang namin yun kasi 3.30 na. So I'm sorry, we will, sorry. We will, we, will, we will continue, but we would just like to promote the next uh, stopover. It will be on November 13 with uh, Gino, Shika, and it will be moderated by Elaine. Yeah. Okay. Let's... Oh, Elaine naman. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, yeah. Guys, punta tayo next week. <laughs> Okay. Um, data privacy, yes, reasonable deadlines. End of contract, this is important. Yeah, there needs to be an end to the timeline. If you need to renew it later on, then so be it. But it can't be an, on, an open contract. That's, that's pretty bad and unfair. Overwork payment, yes, overtime payment. Kailangan yan. Okay. I think I want to keep this Jamboard open if people want to add after the session ends later and we'll keep going back to it. Um, I guess in preparation for the workshop. Okay, so I'm already, <laughs> I'm, I'm bent on the workshop. I think because it's important for us to talk about these things, you know, I want everyone to have a fair exchange we all want to to be compensated fairly and have just working conditions or at least if the the timeline is haggard at least you know right you're you're made aware from the start and there's not a lot of unpleasant surprises in the middle of the project um Transparency over individual organizational adjustments or modifications to agreements. Yes. Like, I think ideally for every amendment that you make in the original conditions, you have to be consulted. Both parties will have to be consulted. Just because I know how to design, does it mean I work on the topics of the project? Yeah, so this is the curse of the multitasker, which I write in also in the publication that I submitted for Load Nadito. That, you know, it's really unfair just because they know you have other skills, they expect you to do it without being offered compensation. Or if there's a budget, then why not hire somebody else? Because actually multitasking is bad for us. Science says, that multitasking is not helpful for our brains. We need to be focused on, on one job at a time. Okay, target dates. Okay. A big question for me is how much to set the price for a service. Ayan. So I, I have no I have no direct answer to this question, but my what I can suggest as a solution is we need more data. We need to do research. I don't know if Con and Mark and the other cultural workers here are willing to, to talk about doing a research. Because we need the baseline first, as Con suggested in our last meeting as well. A baseline data of how much people are getting, what the going rates are, quote unquote, so we know what's fair and what's not. But ideally for me, if you can set your rates in international standards, because a lot of countries have this, then why not? Just because you're Filipino and you're from a third world country, does it mean you know you need to adjust your prices in a third world rate? Because some people are willing to pay an international rate if you kind of um, make that clear at the first instance. Um, okay, I'm just talking now con and mizu please feel free to jump in or any of the other participants please share what you if you have any anecdotes or questions or violent reactions 
I'm gonna stop talking now. I think we, there are we go back to other questions like for example, um, how do you all see the exchange in cultural activity spanning out? That should be like more relevant also to Mizu having to work in like more international platform. Yeah, I'm going up the text from the chat. Yeah, it says, how do you see the exchange in cultural activities panning out? Like, for example, I guess more are, um, because of the online platform, more are making these activities online and it connects us more, but not really. What do you think? Yeah, I also ask, what do you think? Because the only like, yeah, it's easy to attend in because you don't have to go attend, you know, during the pandemic. So I'm very easy to access to other countries. The previous resident artists have given a talk or I can access. And but the, yeah, the the format of artist in residency will be totally change. And um, uh, I don't see. I don't think the online talk, online event is a totally best because now going on, you know, everybody try to, you know, experiment like how to how to connect and how to keep the project, you know, as sustainable, sustainability. Yeah. Mm. Where is the question? I am curious about Mark said, uh, do you believe in the, the zodiac? <laughs> yes, answer it, Mizu. What's your zodiac sign, Mizu? Scorpio. Oh, you're a Scorpio. What's, do you know your moon and your rising? Wow. <laughs> Zoo, sili ka na. <laughs> Zodiac talk na. Change na yung slide ng Jamboard. Ano na, para three. And last time, last time, the artist, you know, uh, the, the, see the map of the Zodiac or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Do you believe in that? Me? Yes, as a guide. I mean, as a general guide, I don't, I try not to let it, I don't know. It's a guide for me. <laughs> I mean, I can adjust if really there's no space, if I put the two opposing um, zodiac signs in a project. <laughs> but if I can help it, I won't. <laughs> when, when, like a long time ago, when new stuff, uh, apply for the as a new staff so I check the birthday year in which zodiac and then how we can communicate better way I don't know why but uh, recently after pandemic also I really care about the zodiac and then yeah star chart something just as a hobby kind of Gon what's your zodiac sign I'm a Capricorn Oh, okay. My moon is Capricorn. Yeah. But I'm a Libra. So actually, magkakasunod tayo. Libra, Scorpio, and then my Sagittarius. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Wait, <laughs> let's answer more questions. Pa. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Naaliho na sa. Okay, what else can we answer? Okay. I want to answer Elaine's Go question on. about like formalizing projects. Yeah. A few years back when the exhibition I did in Blank Compound titled Term House, no, 2012, uh, it was in a commercial gallery and they don't provide um, consignment agreement, like consignment forms or letters to artists and I had to make my own like Moa, because I was showing Agnes Arellano and Alma Pinto, and these are like, of course, more established artists. So if the space or the institution doesn't provide, you make your own. That, I guess, will also um, 
make other people like pay attention to this kind of like system. Some uh, galleries provide like consignment letters, but not all. So that's a problem. So I guess to formalize a project, it has to also start with you, especially if you have more knowledge about it. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of agree there, Con. Um, and similar to you, I also make my own contracts. You know, even if they provide their own contract, sometimes for me it helps to think, it helps me think things through. Like, what do I want to get out of this project? What is my ideal timeline? Um, because sometimes when you're dependent on their, on their contract, you kind of just follow what they said. But if you yourself try to draft your own clauses, then you have a better understanding of what your own values are, what you're willing to work with, what kind of timeline is ideal for you. Um, I guess it also answers what Annie is asking. What is the ideal timeline or duration for a project for me? When is too soon? You know, that really depends on how you work. If you know your working style, because I've worked with artists that are very clear, immediately they know what to do. Um, and they need a short timeline and they deliver. But some people, some artists are more exploratory. They need a lot of research and a lot of daydreaming, a lot of you know, expansive time to experiment before they arrive at the project proposal. So this, this really depends. Um, Know thyself, ayan niya. And be honest about, about, I guess, your own working style as well. If you're more inclined to, to long um, reflection and research, or you're more direct in the way you, you think about making your work. Let's ask Mizu about the question on yeah. how how do you feel about working with friends? Ah, yes. Uh, the friend means like like a school, all the school friends, or or yes, I guess like, like old friend, and then you start working with them. Ah, and then the the, the first uh, when I did a presentation that I did the. Uh, artist in residency with the artist, a friend, friend asked me to join. But it was, yeah, really difficult. difficult. I mean, we need to con make the contract in each other, even though we are friends, you know, because other two, two members are working in the university. And then the, the co-director said, uh, don't work during running residency, only to me. So I, only me, I look after the artist so i should make the contract even though it's artist collective kind of now nowadays the people say the artist collective or yeah artist running the one organization so at the time i was younger i didn't know that so yeah to working with a friend uh, especially with artists uh, better to you know uh, think about more uh, seriously, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean because you're friends, you'll be like good work bodies yeah, yeah. or you may have different work styles. Just like Cheska said, it's also like matching in dating. <laughs> or sometimes some like proper like organization or someone ask me to recommend some artists, nice artists, and then I can introduce, but uh, I don't. I don't know really this organ organizer or someone uh, will look after this my friend artist nicely. So sometimes I really mm, care about that. So I can introduce, but uh, if this my friend artist cannot get enough uh, budget or you know activity uh, at the location, so. I feel bad, so. How about you? Um, I like working with friends, but only <laughs> if I know that they're like 
Yeah. And just Name, specific no? friends, not all your kids, <laughs> right? Just a chosen few. <laughs> yeah. I think also, just to um, share, no, SKL, share ko lang. When I did a big exhibition, I included my husband in an exhibition just so he knows how I work. The, mm-hmm. uh, it was like a, a pivotal time for us and in our relationship because he's an artist. It, he has to understand my time and sometimes I'm strict with work and sometimes I have a specific way of doing things and it was important for me that he knows that. So after that project, they were like more open in communication mm-hmm. and he was more understanding of the yeah, things yeah. that I do. Hmm. When I work with artists, basically I really respect those of artists and then I can work with them. I, I need to trust and I, I really want to work with them. So that's what I can respect. But uh, you know, sometimes the people who don't know about the like, relationship with me as a coordinator and artist and then simply you not know, just introduce me this artist and then yeah, I sometimes I hesitate. Yeah. That I, when but, artists directly ask me some recommendation or something, I really want to help them because we used to work together. So I rely on them. So, yeah. But sometimes we might need, even if though that kind of relationship, we need to make a con- contract on each other. Yeah, for friendship. <laughs> true, to preserve the friendship. And I guess it also has a responsibility mm. because. For example, if you're a curator, it's your job to expand your network so you can include more people in your projects. It's not just like friends and like repeating people in your project. Jessica, what do you think? Um, yeah, I like working with friends, but specific friends. Because again, yeah, already you know which friends what match your working style and which are more, you know, not aligned. <laughs> and it shouldn't be taken personally. Um, also, I guess, paano ko ba frame Because your friends, you know, the creative process becomes easier as well. Because already you have similar histories or a lot of shared experiences. So in terms of entry points, when you discuss the possibilities of an art project, the conversation is easier, for example. Um, Because if you're working with a stranger, that's also good and exciting, but it takes more time to get to know him him or her practice and, and... for, for those, if you're working with somebody new, I really would advise allotting enough time. I don't know how much is enough time to, to really dive deep in their work and art practice because it's hard to work with somebody that you don't understand. <laughs> um, yes, sometimes, right? yeah. Maybe my situation and then Kong and then yeah, Cheska are a bit different because I, I was protected kind of protected by the under the government institution so they definitely pay and then they if they agree they will pay the budget for the project and then but the, what we difficult what we felt i felt difficulty was to to uh, make them understand i mean consensus to take a consensus yeah yeah to to understand and then I get agreement, I really took the time. Whatever artists want to do, whatever artists want to research, sometimes uh, the, the government or like uh, public sector people uh, tend to be um, de- defend, defensive. Defensive, defensive, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, especially for like uh, 2011, or maybe this after this pandemic also, if mm-hmm. artists have a good idea for creating, and even though artists do what they want to do, they request, they, uh, they propose, sometimes uh, the government doesn't agree. Yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, like a protection. So, 
like the, sensor oh, censorship yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that coordinate as we always you know discuss and then not yeah. fighting but uh, <laughs> renegotiate yes yes, yes. <laughs> We're the negotiators, which is emotional work as well, because you're the first one always catching, you know, the the bad feelings of the people who want to complain, <laughs> and you kind of have to scream it. Okay, um, I promised Zeus that I would go back to his question. So he had one very good question. Um, which I'll go back to. He says, if every project will operate on a contract, I can imagine there will be less work or at least no surge of projects unless there is an available budget. Um, I want to respond there because, yes, I, I agree. You know, a lot of people get turned off when there's a long contract that needs to be prepared and signed and discussed before a project has to start. But... I guess my, my re-suggestion there is it doesn't have to be a long contract. You just need, there's a MOA, a memorandum of agreement. Maybe the contract term is too scary. You could frame, you could call it a memorandum of agreement or just an agreement where you say, I, Zeus Bascon, will provide this. And then you, organization, will provide this. You will pay me this on this date. And after that, all the rights are owned by us. And that's it. So there's um, that could be uh, just as a simple document and enough for you to work on, to move forward. So it doesn't have need to have all this, these legal additions that the complicated contracts have. So, again, contracts versus MOA versus letter of intent. From what I know, MOA... Yeah, can I just share? Yeah. Go, go, go. Sige, go. Sorry, Chesta. Sige, sige. Because, sure. we, you know, and we all know how we operate here in the third world. You know? Like, if an artist initiates a project, doesn't really necessarily have to have a budget. Sometimes, like, looking for budget is last on the list. But that doesn't mean... or that won't step, stop us from making contracts or like written things like a letter of intent. Like for example, I would SKL, let me share ko lang. Uh, I, um, I'm curating, co-curating the retrospective of a uh, senior artist and I have here in my studio some of her archives. So we don't have a contract but we have a letter of intent that we want um, the, that we are requesting her to provide us the, like the authority to to just temporarily have this archive because these are important materials that that's one example so like if we are friends doing something an initiative that doesn't have budget we can also draft like a written thing like a letter of intent or something mm -hmm. okay Zeus go <laughs> ang ano ko lang concern ko lang dun kapag syempre pag contract it's more uh, complete diba parang all sections check pero um, with for example yung example ni Con about uh, storing archive parang there's so much additional work um, uncompensated um, um, kumbaga kailangan ba yun o, o we see it as necessary so we do it regardless pero kumbaga um, the extent of labor and yung, um, emotional or uh, mental um, factors included there is ano nga, um, it's so much. <laughs> Parang ganun. So, oh, yun yung gusto kong so i- uh, <laughs> yun yung gusto kong i-clarify with um, the work um, cultural workers here in the Philippines usually um, partake. You have to answer siguro. No? Kaya nga, I think, contract man yan or BOA or letter of intent. The benefit, you both should benefit from it. For example, I'm holding on an archive and I can write something about it for my own like work or for my thesis or whatever. No? So, meron pa rin, you also have the right on that thing, project or object or whatever. No? So, it, 
it doesn't mean a corporate art manager or coordinator, we don't benefit from the projects. We also do in a different manner that's not maybe imaginable to you. Kaya, we have to communicate about it. What are the things that will benefit me? What are the things that will benefit you? And that should be in the contract or written thing. You. Ayan. Ayan, yung contract writing workshop tayo. Thank you. Thank you for answering. <laughs> Formal. Yeah. Um, wait, so we are now nearing 4 p.m. We were supposed to end at 3.30 p.m. I think we had... Thank you, everybody who participated and will keep this jam board. And if I have time before November ends, I'll try to, you know, I'll, I'll make something from the, the stuff that we've written here because these are all valid comments. I don't know if it's an essay or if I'll rearrange this into something or you know, this will be input that we can use for a future contract workshop, contract writing workshop. <laughs> it's good to see that we have similar concerns. You know, we just don't have the time and the space and the opportunity to talk to each other. But there's a lot of knowledge among us already with the audience as well that we can share um, to try to, to figure out how to move forward. Um, we had one last kind of provocative question, um, which is, okay, so now we've, we've written what we want to see in a contract and we've asked each other what are the best practices in making agreements and contracts. But I think Mayumi also gave this question to us. Um, how do we ensure that we have a caring system to make these contracts effective because you know as much many doc as many documents that we write and ask other organizations to sign or each other to sign if nobody will enforce it or help us you know when we hit snags how are we committed to supporting each other um, to make to ensure these contracts are implemented me personally, yes. And my, my contribution, I guess, is I can co-facilitate that contract working workshop <laughs> so that um, people are informed about what they can and cannot negotiate. Um, yes. How, I don't know. That, it's an open question. Mayumi, do you want to kind of um, explain it more? Maybe your question about that. I was also chatting with Mizuho behind the scene just now. And she even mentioned that even after um, we propose like um, estimate and then the organizer keeps um, negotiating it. So we, you know, the price gets lower and lower and lower. So I think that also happens in many different places and, and the contract only follows after that, but it's still the process is so long. And I feel like <clears throat> there has to be um, I don't know, mutual protective system that maybe unnecessary negotiations we can skip. And I feel like um, maybe having this kind of conversation more regularly, so it becomes a bit visible to the public, maybe that can start to generate some sort of um, movement. And I think whoever wants to join, maybe they can come. But I think continuing this conversation is quite important because I think, you know, it's just contract is a piece of paper. And most of the time who commissions us has so much stronger power and presence. So for them, it feels like it's easier to just scratch or ignore this contract. So the question is, I think, how to empower us as individually practicing very precarious um, labors. And I think first step that I think we can do is to continue this conversation and create a sense of solidarity and make it visible. That's something that just yeah, came to my mind. Baby steps, yes, mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I am willing to participate again in more.
sessions mm-hmm. like this because you know we talk a lot about aesthetics in our processes which is great but we also need to talk about the conditions of how we make art and how we do these art projects right mm-hmm. i think we're at that stage already mm-hmm. that questioning the precarity of the labor that we do yeah and i we were just talking to a different collectives and they were talking about sustainability, question of sustainability. How do we sustain as cultural workers or artists? And one way for them as a strategy was to work with people from different disciplines. So I think, you know, thinking about these labor conditions, I think we need help of different professionals also. So maybe make this as more of an open platform. Also that can also help, I think. For sure. Hi, Piwi! Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Naka-on yung camera mo. Ayan. Maka-mute ka. Oh, okay. Happy to be here. Even if I'm late. <laughs> Thank Almost you, Piwi. I <laughs> uh, just came from another Zoom room. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Ganun na nga ngayon. <laughs> Back to back Zoom meetings. Yeah, we were just talking about the precarity of cultural labor <laughs> and how we need to, to keep these conversations going, I guess. Um, there was a suggestion to start unionizing, which I'm totally open to. <laughs> um, yeah, but let's see, baby steps. <laughs> mm. Yeah, actually, my miss said, as my, my miss said, you know, I also like, I was lucky to be kind of a friend, but working together with the therapist and then doctors in art project, because uh, otherwise I had no, I had no chance to know the more detail about the situation of the hospital. It was the just beginning of the pandemic start. So, so even though out of field people want to do the project, so the partner of different field people, uh, they have their own business. And then I need to know, I concern the different field people. And also I could know uh, each other. And then they, we really don't know, uh, we really know about art communication, you know, art world, and then uh, how to running, how to working among artists and the curators and the coordinators. but. Uh, in the other hand, and another other field, there are a lot of other people who might like uh, to watching art or participate in art project. So sometimes to know, uh, to need, need to collaborate the, with different field. And then I got to know, ah, my situation is something strange uh, from other field people that working style, yeah. Yes, yeah. So I think just to support that, it's important to to consult with other, mm. with people from other disciplines as well, um, because we have a lot to learn from each other. Especially, you know, helping with empathy and seeing perspectives from from different eyes. Okay. Uh, you, okay, go. I, I, I don't know if I, I will be out of line, uh, but since you're talking about uh, labor, artistic labor, I think that this is also relevant to the other Zoom room I've been to. So it was a talk about uh, ind- indigenous people's rights. Okay? Uh, because I'm one of many artists maybe, uh, who have been doing works inspired, uh, quote unquote, inspired by uh, indigenous culture. Like in my case, the Panay Bukidnon in uh, Panay Island. And in, in the forum uh, a while ago, I learned I learned that the in, the indigenous people are very very sensitive. I don't want to use the word possessive because I don't think that's the right word. 
but I think uh, there, uh, there is a sentiment that the indigenous people are sometimes offended when their traditional motifs or traditional elements are used by some artists and are out of context. Um, and and th this is where I guess we could uh, touch on the issue of labor because the NICP, the, the National Indigenous People's Committee, NI, what's that? But it is a commission to protect indigenous people. Uh, they have established uh, certain guidelines wherein if artists will use research or text or some forms of indigenous patterns or motifs, they are obliged to pay the community. The community. So uh, I, did, I did not know that, that uh, before I attended this uh, symposium earlier. So I think there are a lot of things that the art uh, community should start uh, learning uh, one is artistic labor, uh, which is not, I, I don't know, uh, Chess, uh, if you will agree with me, uh, a, a topic that is very, very sensitive and, and uh, tricky within the arts community. I, I don't think people are comfortable talking about that. Uh, and then um, uh, rights or copyrights. Sorry, sorry if that was out of line, but uh, I, I, I wanted to participate in this conversation because I'm happy to see Con and Misuhu. <laughs> How are you, Misuhu? <laughs> um, I think that was a good addition, Piwi. Right before you went in, we were talking about contracts and the need to put everything on paper to document agreements because this is not a common practice among independent practitioners. So we kind of use that as a jump, jump of point to kind of rethink how we, we enter into our agreements with each other and with organizations and institutions because usually a lack of clarity is the reason why projects fall through or don't work out, right? And I guess that relates to what you said about copyrights as well. That should be in the contract. And, you know, labor, artistic labor, the times that you put in and the, the compensation, the remuneration for your artistic labor should be clear and renegotiated if it's not a fair price that was set for you. And this is all very ideal, of course. We're not there yet, but it was just a good conversation today that at least we started talking about this. And there's a lot of um, common sentiments. Um, sharing the same thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, can I also just share? But um, Renan also raised something when she, he said that it's, the contract is not the end all and be all. So if we're talking about contract, we also should talk about the other things about it. Like it can be oppressive. It's not, it, it's not supposed to standardize relationships. Because of course, like um, PV said, a contract is also used to oppress the indigenous. I know of an instance that a, a like co clothing company like um like applied for a patent for the diamond shape. So every other community cannot use the diamond shape because it was like patented for that clothing company. So that's a way of like a contract oppressing others. So I guess if we are trying to talk about this form of contract comes with the territory that we also talk about the other things that that is also like a reality it is used by corporations etc i guess we revisit also the chat no? there's interesting conversation there you know uh con as a follow-up to that uh contracts i learned also that contracts with the indigenous people's community are already existing. 
I mean, this is not something that we have to invent. There is such a thing as indigenous knowledge systems and practices. This is the law that governs the use of existing knowledge on indigenous people and cultural traditions. So if there are artists and cultural workers who are interested in, of course, the common term is appropriation, right? Uh, appropriate um, this knowledge from the indigenous people, then all these people have to do is to confer with the IPRA. IPRA. So they call this IPRA, Indigenous Knowledge Systems and Practices. So there, so uh, where do I want to go? Okay, so this is not my main point. My main point is, con, how do we compensate, for example, appropriating uh, the, the sugarcane workers, for example, okay? Uh, exploiting the condition of sugarcane workers in uh, painting, post posturing as a social realist. But this particular artist uh, would clearly show no uh, sympathy to, to the cause of the sugar workers in Negros, for example. How, how, do, how do you account that particular artist in recognizing the fact that, hey, you know, you're appropriating something that you don't even believe in, and, and, and yet uh, the subject uh, of your work uh, does not get anything from it. See? Isn't that the problem of SR years ago? I mean, <laughs> no, 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 we but... are burdened with that problem also, and it is perpetuated by younger artists. No, our, uh, younger in, artists in fairness, in fairness, in fairness, con the SR of the 80s, they knew what they were doing. They were part of the movement. They were you know, pushing forward this national democratic struggle. They know, they immerse, they understand. So that generation, I think, is, is free of that burden. So I, I think I'm trying to refer to the new generation of uh, uh, trying hard to be social realists. I'm sorry, um, Miss Moderator Cheska, if you're <laughs> hearing away from the topic. <laughs> No, thank you, Mimi. Thank you, thank you for this um, exciting last few minutes. Um, we were about to close the session. <laughs> um, but yeah, that has been quite exciting. Meron, may pasabog, sabi niya. Um, yes, we've gone over 45 minutes now. <laughs> so, we're really sorry, Mayumi and Mark, and thank you so much to everyone who participated. Um, I will keep this Jamboard and those who wanted to for me to send like drafts of MOAs that you can kind of tweak for yourselves as a start. Um, I will revisit this chat and, and send it to you. Um, Okay, that's that's it for me. Thank you so much for such a, an interesting conversation and very, very insightful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica, Kwon, and Mizuho, and Piwi, the, our guest of honor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sure everyone's very thirsty. So I think it's time for us to say goodbye and each of us will go get beer or something. But, uh -huh. um, <laughs> but um, um, we hope to continue these discussions and if Lord Nadito can be used as a platform, we are very happy to do that. So um, I, we really hope to continue these discussions. And let's take photograph. Okay, please turn on your videos. Just uh, take a photograph. Just for reporting purposes, because we have a contract with JF. <laughs> 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 okay, one, two, three. Isa pa? One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And maybe we can briefly mention the next session. Yeah. So the next session where Jerome showed you will be on uh, November 14, 
just to quickly show, I don't have my. Yeah, I think I can share. Wait a minute. Here. Ah, here. So yeah. I can share. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jerome so, is following the contract with his dog. Yeah, so he just left. <laughs> so our last studio visit will be on November 13, pala, Saturday, and it will be with Gino and Chica Kunz Corona. And it will be moderated by Alain Camille, who is here right now. So thank you very much.